Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. On January 8th, 2024, at 2.18 a.m. Eastern Time, the first moon lander launched by the United States in over half a century made its way off the launch pad on a Vulcan Centaur rocket. Indeed, the first Vulcan Centaur to ever be launched, and everything went extremely well with the mission for a considerable amount of time. The rocket functioned perfectly. It deployed the payload exactly as expected. And then almost immediately after that, things went very, very wrong. But now, after a wait of eight and a half months, Astrobotic has revealed all of the reasons that the mission appears to have gone wrong, what was lost, and what was gained in spite of the malfunction. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. So as you can see, I had a lot of personal emotion invested in this flight of the Astrobotic Peregrine on the maiden launch of the Vulcan Centaur. Yes, I also had a personal stake in regards to placing a bet that Vulcan Centaur would actually make it into space, or make it into orbit anyway, before Starship could make it into orbit. A bet which I won, by the way, by a couple of months but I had a lot more emotion invested in the success of Peregrine given the amount of time that I had taken to get to know the Astrobotic team, the amazingly talented people in Pittsburgh who had been so committed to the success of this, the first mission to attempt to land on the surface of the moon launched by the United States, that is, in over half a century, and of course, Astro Liz's time capsule that she had on board, which she so desperately hoped would land on the surface of the moon, although I have to admit, she took it very, very well when this didn't actually happen, and seemed very content to know that her payload not only made it into space, but into into interplanetary space. But we're going to go ahead and give you some background as Astrobotic announced it a couple of days ago, something I intended to bring to you a little bit sooner, but all of this stuff happening with SpaceX lately kind of interdicted this story. So I apologize for the late arrival of this story, but here's what we know. Less than an hour after liftoff, the Peregrine spacecraft had separated successfully from the Vulcan Centaur in the appropriate trajectory and activated its avionics and power management system and established communications with Astrobotics Mission Control Center via NASA's Deep Space Network and commenced spacecraft commissioning and operations. However, during this commissioning phase, Peregrine's propulsion system was activated and an in-flight anomaly occurred almost immediately. The team, however, was able to stabilize and operate the spacecraft for 10 days and 14 hours as it traveled to and from cislunar space. And quite a number of things were accomplished during this flight. There are two scientific teams that were able to publish scientific papers from the data collected by their payloads, which didn't make it to the surface of the moon, but still gathered a large amount of useful information regardless. So after a lengthy investigation chaired by independent third-party investigator Dr. John Horak, professor and Neil Armstrong chair at Ohio State University, the investigation team concluded that the most probable cause of the anomaly was a failure of a single helium pressure control valve known as PCV2 within the propulsion system. It apparently suffered a loss of seal capability, most likely due to a mechanical failure caused by vibration in 
initiated relaxation between the threaded components internal to the valve. They duplicated the same types of vibrations that were being experienced on the Vulcan Centaur at the time of the launch, and they were able to duplicate the error. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, why did this happen? Why did they not know that the vibrations that were typical to the Vulcan Centaur launch might create this kind of anomaly? Was it because the Vulcan Centaur had greater vibration than was originally thought, and it was the rocket that was actually responsible for the problem and not the spacecraft? Well, no, that's not actually the case. One of the big culprits for this whole thing, like so many things in spaceflight right now, was the COVID-19 pandemic. During this time, because of problems associated with the pandemic, the contractor responsible for these valves was unable to deliver them on schedule, and this was going to jeopardize the entire mission for NASA. So as a result, Astrobotic took charge of the propulsion system, including these valves, and developed everything in-house. They were already starting to do this with future propulsion systems for their future landing craft anyway, so all of this was fairly convenient, or so they thought at the time. However, as time went on, some of these valves started to experience problems. From April to November of 2022, as Astrobotic was incrementally assembling the propulsion feed system, problems started to come up with these helium control valves, and this controlled the helium pressure into the fuel and oxidizer tanks. As the company worked to resolve this issue, it faced the looming threat of missing the committed two dates for spacecraft acceptance testing required for launch. In August of 2022, the team made the decision to pivot to an alternate PCV supplier that was already providing pyrotechnic valves for the feed system and could commit to the current schedule. However, when the new valves were delivered and installed, PCV-1, there were two of these valves, the PCV-1 encountered leaks during testing, but PCV-2 did not. PCV-1 was easily accessible on the spacecraft, it was quickly repaired, and successfully passed another round of proof testing. The spacecraft was then fully assembled into flight configuration, and it successfully passed its test campaign, which included vibration, acoustics, thermal vacuum, and electromagnetic interference testing. However, PCV-2, the valve that eventually failed, was still carried at a risk because of the repairs that PCV-1 had required. However, the likelihood of PCV-2 failing was characterized as being a low probability because of the successful acceptance test campaign. And also, PCV-2 was located deep inside the spacecraft, and removing it for additional testing, replacement, and repair would have required substantial spacecraft disassembly, which would have invalidated costly, time-intensive spacecraft acceptance tests that had already been completed and could not be rescheduled without missing Peregrine's scheduled launch date. Really, I can understand why they made the decision that they did. It appeared that PCV-2 Two, one valve in the entire propulsion system that seemed to be in good shape wouldn't fail even though PCV-1, its twin, had failed during this testing process, at least at first. If they had been more comprehensive in their repair efforts, they probably should have replaced the other valve, but at the same time, as they said, had they done that, they would have had to have disassembled the entire propulsion system and probably would have missed their launch date, or even worse, disassembling the entire propulsion system might have led to damage being sustained to other parts of the propulsion system, which would have gone overlooked probably that late in the test campaign. I really don't see where Astrobotic had much of an alternative. In hindsight, yeah, 
Replacing the valve was the only wise thing to do, but without the benefit of hindsight, I don't see how any reasonable person could have made that decision. That having been said, we really need to focus on how incredible of a job the Astrobotic team did in getting the spacecraft operational to the best of their ability in spite of the failure of the propulsion system. They managed to make use of what fuel they had left to orient the spacecraft properly so the solar panels were facing in the correct direction and so all the payloads on board would remain operational and at least they could gain something out of them scientifically and what they did gain was pretty substantial so let's go ahead and talk a bit about what the team actually managed to do first of all a number of other anomalies did actually crop up during this process a total of eight anomalies that could have potentially been mission ending they were solved in real time along with five other anomalies that were relatively minor but also were solved in real time it's so unfortunate that this one valve went wrong because near as we can tell everything else on the spacecraft was performing extremely well so four days after launch peregrine had actually reached lunar distance 351,000 kilometers away from the moon and the spacecraft had remained stable and operable and had collected and returned data from all nine of the payloads that were designed to communicate with the lander. The other 11 payloads on board were passive payloads. By the way, the majority of the payloads on the spacecraft were actually private commercial payloads and not NASA payloads. But two of these NASA payloads, the Linear Energy Transfer Spectrometer, or the LETS, and the Neutron Spectrometer System, or NSS, and one commercial payload, the German Aerospace Center's M4, 42 radiation detection collected publishable scientific data. Now the remainder of the payloads performed checkouts, tests, and collected non-scientific data which will still be valuable for instrument calibration and operation on future missions. Now, after reaching lunar distance and rounding apogee, Peregrine began its return trip to Earth, and new ranging data was soon received, which, when used to update the predicted thrust of the leak in the orbit determination module, showed that the perigee had degraded to the point to where Peregrine was on a collision trajectory to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. So at this point, Astrobotic had a decision to make. Because the leak had led to a high fuel mixture ratio, Astrobotic reached out to the engine vendor who theorized that the axial engines could be operated at the high mixture ratio for short duration pulses. In order to test this theory, Astrobotic developed a procedure to command the center engine to fire for 200 milliseconds, which resulted in an above nominal axial thrust and a temperature increase on the engine valve. This confirmed that there was a high mixture ratio ratio, which is dangerous, but it also demonstrated that the engine could be used in short pulses. And so the flight dynamics and propulsion teams developed some maneuver scenarios to where Peregrine could be returned to a lunar orbit or a sun-synchronous orbit or to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And ultimately, Astrobotic, in consultation with NASA, decided that the most responsible thing to do would be to re-enter the atmosphere. However, I also maintain that there is an alternate and very rational story that came out at this time from very reliable sources that supports the notion that NASA actually compelled Astrobotic to make the decision to re-enter the atmosphere rather than keeping the spacecraft in space for as long as possible. I'm not going to go into all the details of what happened in this particular story or what the details were, but if you're interested in that, I have the video linked at the end of this one. So, in the end result, yes, this was a disappointment. 
definitely a setback for Astrobotic. But at the same time, lessons have been learned. A lot was learned also about Astrobotic's technology, what might go wrong with it, and how they can correct this for the future Griffin mission. However, as many of you probably know, Griffin is not going to be carrying its most important payload, the Viper Lunar Rover, which is designed to sniff out lunar ice and to give us a lot more information, which we desperately need about this in situ resource. Hopefully, NASA changes their mind on this, and I'm going to be releasing a video that covers this very controversial topic, together with the testimony of a number of of different competitors in what's called the Aqua Lunar Challenge here in the United Kingdom, a challenge that's sponsored by the UK Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency with the objective of removing impurities and toxins from lunar ice in order to make it useful for our future lunar base. I'm going to get you all the details on that and everything coming up with Astrobotic as well, including, check this out, pretty cool new lunar rover that Astrobotic is designing at the moment, together with many other projects that this amazing company in Pittsburgh is working on. They are the heart, the nerve center of an extremely vibrant space industry that is replacing the aging steel industry in Pittsburgh. And I'll tell you, this industry is transforming Pittsburgh in a very big way, very positive. If you ever get a chance to visit this city in the future, I strongly recommend that you do so. So thanks very much for watching and also I would like to thank Mike Harner, Nick B, and Scott Carr, and also Okies, who edited their Patreon membership up significantly. Thanks to all of you for your support and to all of my Patreon supporters. You're making a big difference in my ability to make my future trip to the United States a very comprehensive one, where hopefully I'll be bringing you lots of stories about spaceflight, not just the Crew 9 missions. I'll keep you all all up to date and in the meantime stay angry about space